Welcome to the Autism in Black podcast, where we focus on all things autism and the Black parent experience. Our goal is to always educate, support, and empower parents to advocate for not only their children, but themselves. Hello, and welcome to the Autism in Black podcast. I'm Maria Davis-Pierre, a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Florida, and America's number one autism advocate for Black parents. I am the founder and CEO of Autism and Black Inc., where we aim to include the excluded. Today, we have Herdeen Mercier, who is a licensed clinical social worker, certified grief coach, and transformational speaker. She is also the host of the Redefining Grief podcast. Herdeen's life calling is to create non-judgmental spaces for broken hearts to heal so purposeful living can be restored. Herdeen believes that happiness and sadness exist in a delicate balance. Herdeen is committed to redefining how we, as a society, understand grief. She defines grief as being normal and natural reaction to any loss or change in normalcy. Through her teachings, Herdeen encourages individuals to understand that life is not perfect, but it must be lived. Herdeen strongly believes the goal is not to allow our unhappiness to overtake the good times, the successes, and the laughter and joys in order to maintain our emotional well being. As the founder of Redefining Grief, Herdeen has built a community of individuals committed to living their best life, anchored down in purposeful living despite what life throws at them. I'm really excited at having Hardeen on the show today to talk to us about a difficult topic that we kind of shy away from. So enjoy today's episode. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Autism in Black podcast. Today, we have a very special guest who is going to talk to us about grief. And this is an important episode for us as parents, because I think a lot of times we skip over this whole grieving process. So today, we have Herdeen Mercer. Herdeen Mercer is in the house. Oh my God, I'm super excited. Thank you so much, Maria, for giving me the opportunity to do what my life purpose is, is to help people grieve and create a non-judgmental space where broken hearts can heal. Yeah. I love it every time I say it. Uh, I'm so, so excited. So I want to go ahead and get right in and jump right to it. So can you tell us what is grief? Because you know, so many of us just think it's about losing a loved one. Oh, there are so many um, hats when it comes to to grief. Grief, first of all, grief is a natural reaction to any loss. Mm. Grief is a natural reaction to any loss. Mm. And it's grief is just not under the umbrella of death, like you said. You could be grieving because you went through a divorce. You can be grieving because of the loss of your health. You could be grieving because of the loss of a job. You could be grieving because of pet loss, mm-hmm. moving, um, so many reasons, hair loss. Especially for us as Black women, we're told all the time that your hair is your crown, but then you go to a doctor's appointment and find out that you've been diagnosed with alopecia. So what happens to my crown? Yes. And so emotions come up that people don't know what to do with because we've never been taught how to grieve. So my life purpose is creating that space. Where you can grieve and show emotions and not feel judged. Yes, that that part about showing the emotion. Mm Because, you know, as parents, um, when we show emotions, particularly related to our children, a lot of times we get shamed for those emotions, you know. So we, we don't really deal with the emotions, especially surrounding, you know, children with disabilities and having a child with a disability because we know Mm -hmm. that getting a child's diagnosis is difficult because as a parent we've already decided who our children are going to be before they're even born you know Mm -hmm. so what should parents know about the grief process 
I think one of the things they should know about the grief process is there's some myths. Mm -hmm. So let me start off with the myth so you can have the aha to receive the pow. Mm -hmm. And pow is what I call pearls of wisdom. So one of the things that I will tell you is that there is no stages to grief. That's a myth. Oftentimes people say the stages of grief that Dr. Elizabeth Ross created, but those were for death and dying patients. They went through all of those emotions and those stages. But when you think about grief, grief is that emotion, that heartbreak. If I were to break down grief and really tell you what it is, it's a heartbreak. Mm -hmm. And so for your audience in thinking about children and diagnosis and, and receiving a diagnosis about your child, there's a heartbreak that comes with that. And you alluded to it earlier when you said you've already, from the time you conceived, and found out you were pregnant and found out the sex of the baby, guess what we naturally do? We think about them in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. We think about them graduating high school. We think about them go to college, going to college. We think about them walking down the aisle. Like we associate all of these, our visions for them, our hopes and our dreams for them. But once you get a diagnosis, you are left to question, oh my God, what? Mm -hmm. So you find yourself questioning and then you may even feel guilty. You know, oftentimes the guilt may come up because oftentimes when your child gets a diagnosis, what I hear from clients is, what did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. Yes. What did I do wrong? Was it me drinking and not knowing that I was pregnant? Did I, did I do something yeah. to get this diagnosis for my child? And then let me tell you another area of grief that people don't realize. Grief is this conflicting emotion. Mm. One minute you're relieved that you got the diagnosis and the other minute you're, you are filled with feelings of confusion, concern, and fear. And how could you have both? Yes, that, oh my gosh, that is a great point. It, it's a conflicting thing because you get the, the diagnosis, or you, you knew you were going to get the diagnosis, but hearing the words just makes it different. Yes, and you have a sense of, I feel relieved. Why? Mm -hmm. Because you've been telling the doctor so long I'm not the expert, but I am the mama. Mm -hmm. And what I can tell you is something is not right. Mm -hmm. And I know your story, Maria, as far as you knew early on and they were waiting for an age to really diagnose, but you had to step in and advocate. Mm -hmm. But when they finally gave you the diagnosis, there may have been a possibility that you grieved mm -hmm. with relief. Because it's like, I've been fighting, I've been saying it for so long, and now someone actually sees me, hears me, and validates my emotions. You know, I never thought about it in that aspect, because many people are like, did you grieve? And I, I only thought about it in the sadness part. And I was like, no, I was just so relieved. I was ready to go. But now that you're saying that, that is, uh, you know, what I was going through as well, a relief, like, oh my gosh, it was validation. Mm -hmm. And so I like to think of grief as being this melting pot of all emotions. Mm -hmm. And the thing about grief, there's, there's really no time frame. What do you mean there's no time frame? Whether you like it or not, this life is not perfect, but the requirement of living it is. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, we like to put a time frame to sadness a time frame to heartbreak. We like to replace. And when I say replace, well, you got this devastating news. You feel the emotions of sadness. You feel the emotions of relief. You feel the emotions of confusions. You may even feel the emotions of fear. You're feeling it all, but the very next thing you may ask yourself is, when will this end? Mm -hmm. But the, for your audience, this is a lifetime diagnosis. Yes. 
So you're going to feel it. And the, and this is where my anchors come in. I've developed these grief anchors and in these anchors, what I have found in going through my own grief experience and looking at Dr. Ross's work with a crooked eye and thinking, you know, I'm looking at it like shady because I know I'm feeling these emotions, but none of it is really applying the way well, I already was angry. Mm -hmm. So now how come, when am I going to get to that stage of relief? And so it's actually looking it at, it's anchoring down in the truth. Mm. is the very first anchor. And when we anchor down in the truth, what happens? Freedom. Mm. You felt freed by your doctors when they validated you. Yeah. They saw you and they heard you because you were telling them for so long. Mm -hmm. So once you are able to anchor down in that freedom, what happens? Now you can begin the groundwork of healing, mm -hmm. of making a decision, of moving forward in a positive light. That's the very first anchor. Mm -hmm. Then the second anchor is the heartbreak. It's that heart anchor. It's the time to really now examine all the emotions that you're feeling. Because you've anchored down in the truth that you may be hurt by hearing the diagnosis. What does this mean? How do I move forward? You understand? Like we're anchoring down in that heartache. And oftentimes when you anchor down in heartbreak, the very third anchor is saying, I'm, I need to connect. Okay. Because the very reason I put connection anchor in here, because we need community. Oh, yeah. Oftentimes, we, not even oftentimes, majority of the households may have never been taught how to feel sad and be okay with it. Yeah. Oftentimes, we hear, mommy needs time to be alone. Mommy needs time to cry. Don't go bother mommy. Don't go bother daddy right now. They're sad or they're hurting, right? Leave them alone. Don't go in the room. So what does that do to us? Or as children, go to your room and cry. Mm. So from an early age, we're taught, hmm, so when you feel sad, you should do it alone. Wow. I never thought about it that way. And, and you know, that connection piece is so important uh, to us parents who have children with disabilities because it's the piece that is often missing for us mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't quite understand what it's like. So that piece is where a lot of us get hung up on because we're like, well, they don't understand. They don't know. And where's my, where do I find my people, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and one of the things that I say whenever I talk about the connection anchor, there is power in community. Mm -hmm. And you said it, it's finding the community. But what happens and what keeps people from finding the community, if we don't teach our children, it's okay to feel sadness. Yes. It's okay to cry. You don't have to bottle it up in. That's why people sometimes are afraid to go and see a therapist. Mm -hmm. Because they are afraid of actually feeling their emotions for the very first time. Yes, especially in the Black community, because, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, we don't get to do that. We don't get to, to feel it. We're taught to suck it up, to, to keep moving, not only from those in our community, but for those outside of our community. You know, they think we're tougher because we're Black, you know, so they're mm -hmm. like you'll be fine. So it's mm -hmm. always getting this constant message of your emotions don't matter. Your feelings don't matter. Mm -hmm. And so if the world is constantly sending out these waves, it's the whole reason why I have a podcast. Mm -hmm. It's my way of educating the world and having my grief crusaders community and saying, you do not have to grieve alone. Mm. We have to redefine what grief is. It's heartbreak. 
And this life is not perfect. We will experience heartbreak whether we like it or not. Mm-hmm. But we have to be taught how to deal with it. One of the main reasons, you know, when I tell people that they often laugh, I don't honk my horn. Mm-hmm. I don't honk my horn unless my life is incomplete. You know, I'm in danger. Yes. yes. My family and friends are like, you honked your horn. You almost, you you probably was going to die that day. Like I don't honk my horn because I realize people are, their emotions are bottled up. Yes. They're bottled up. They don't know how to give it a name. Mm -hmm. So true. And so if you're driving around like that, I don't want my life to end because I am the end result of you never dealing with your emotions. And so it's literally now even in sessions teaching clients how to use I feel this statement. Yes, yes. And the other thing that I want to point out, we also need to be careful when we ask how people are doing. Because if you're going to ask the question, yes, (laughs) listen for the response and be engaged. Yes. And, and for those who are giving the response, give the true response. Cause a lot of times we're so programmed to say, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is so true. Like literally today I was at the dentist and he asked and I literally paused. I find myself now pausing mm-hmm. so that I can give a genuine response, give a genuine response. Yes. And I think when we learn to do that, then we'll find out who's really our community that sees us, hears us, and validates us, and those who really aren't. Yes, that is a good point. Good point. Because what what people don't realize is that the thing that breaks my heart about those who are dealing with any heartbreak or grief is that they're isolated. Who do you tell? Hmm. Everyone has an opinion. Yes. Yes. And how you should do it. And, you know, like you were saying, putting a timeline on it and, and so much, and it, it makes it the, the process even more emotional, mm-hmm. even more frustrating, even more overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cause what people don't realize is they are in a rush to get you back to normal, mm-hmm. but the diagnosis has just changed your normalcy. Yes. And And you need time to grieve that. Yes. And it, it, at different stages, you know, because our children grow up at different stages. So it's going to be different things that we feel at the different stages they're at. And I don't think people quite understand that or or grasp that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oftentimes what I find is, that people feel guilty in saying that today was just a really bad day emotionally Mm -hmm. because they are afraid of being judged. Yes. And you need community. That's why I'm going back to that connection anchor. You need community that would allow you to say today was just a bad day. Mm Mm-hmm. The bad day, it was a bad grocery trip day. It was a bad day at the airport. Because oftentimes what what you get back is, but you're blessed to have a daughter. Yes. You're blessed to have a son. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm not blessed. I'm not saying that I I don't love my child. Mm -hmm. But today was a really hard day. Yes. People don't quite understand that. And, you know, that's... One of the things that I, I do for any of those, uh, any of you who are in the autism and black community is, you know, knowing that it is frustrating. It is overwhelming. We do have bad days, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm necessarily mad at my child or, you know, frustrated with my child. I'm frustrated with the diagnosis. Yes. And that's why that community piece is so important. And then that fourth anchor is the faith anchor. Mm -hmm. And the faith anchor is saying, trusting without reservation. 
Because oftentimes when you have a heartbreak, the very first person you question if you are a religious person is God. Yes. You have questions for him. And oftentimes grievers, when they begin to ask their questions, they are silented. They are silenced with response like, but you got to trust God. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't give you anything you wouldn't bear, but you didn't ask for this. Yeah. Why did he choose me? And you should be able to ask those questions in your faith-based community. Oh, that is a, I mean, you would be surprised at the amount of clients that I'm, you know, have that are dealing with church hurt who, you know, are going to their church community and, and going to their pastors and their pastors Mm -hmm. tell them things like, you know, it's your sins that caused your child's diagnosis. You know, that is a so hurt. It's, it's, I, I just can't even fathom someone saying that to me. So when I'm hearing my clients say things like this, it's like, wow. You know, so that, again, then gives them the struggle with faith, because we know in the Black community, faith is a a Mm -hmm. strong anchor for a lot of us. So then struggling with that, you know, it it is my fault that my child has this diagnosis for sins I committed. Mm -hmm. It's heartbreaking. I like, my eyes are welling up. Just hearing you say that pastors have told your clients that it's their sins that have made their child like this. Like, how do you begin to open? But God is a loving God. What happened to that? Yeah. You know? And so I put the faith anchor in there because I felt like we question him. And it's that you can't touch it. It's that you can't get to it. You can't have a face on it, but you question the creator. Mm -hmm. And you want answers. And boy, does he bring it. He does bring them. This is just based off my own personal experience with my grief journey. But he brought the answers when I took time to examine my feelings around the church hurt or the faith hurt or questioning who he is as my creator. But I needed that community, that safe community or that therapist, or that good sister friend who will hear me out without interrupting, allow me to express myself, get it out, and then process with me without comparing. Mm -hmm. Right? And then we have the final anchor, which is restoration. It is that place of emotional well-being emotional well-being with the grief journey that when you arrive at that place it is saying you are arriving at a place where now you can find purpose Mm -hmm. from the hurt you can look at it and so for some people they need like why why me and so why you it may look different for everyone i can't answer that but For me, Maria, although you've had this diagnosis, now you've now a champion. Now that you've set in your your heartache, you know, Mm -hmm. you told the truth about your heartache and you're unapologetic about who you are and who's your child. Yes. That now you begin to pull out the purpose and now you become the advocator. But let me tell you something about being the advocator that I want you to be very aware of for all those who may be having that advocator heart. Mm -hmm. Just because you're the advocator does not mean you have to be perfect. Yes. Yes. The advocator too needs downtime. Mm -hmm. The advocator too needs to remove the superwoman cape. And it's okay to be the advocator and not have all the answers. Oh my gosh. You are, you are preaching a word today. (laughs) Because oftentimes we are trying to see the entire, and I'm guilty for that too. See from beginning to end and it wasn't meant to be. Some days you're just going to need to take it day by day. Mm -hmm. 
And know that that's okay. And know that is okay. Mm -hmm. For there is no absolutes in grief. Mm. There's really no universal way, no universal steps, but I've created a process that works for me. And what I found with that process, it is working for my clients. Mm. Because it is centered around a safe place without judgment. Yes. And that is so important because a lot of us don't get that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the things that I want to add, Maria, is oftentimes people are, are going to therapists, right? And they get this diagnosis mm-hmm. and they are labeled depressed, right? Mm -hmm. But oftentimes depression isn't the diagnosis, it's grief. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they're being misdiagnosed and not receiving any relief. Yep. And so if you're misdiagnosed, you can go through all the therapeutic sessions that you, for the next couple of years. Mm. But if you don't go through the bereavement process of certain things, in really examining how you feel, Mm -hmm. what I believe happens is that you get closure. Yes. You get closure when you're able to anchor down in the truth. You get closure when you are able to anchor down and examine your heartache. You get closure when you find that community. You get closure when you have those talks with God. You get closure when you get to restoration. Mm -hmm. Because restoration is saying, I'm not returning to my old self. I'm returning to my natural state of being in a place of peace. Mm -hmm. And in that peace, I'm understanding it, that I will have grief flare-ups. What are grief flare-ups, Herdeen? Grief flare-ups are fifth grade, right? Mm -hmm. Your child is graduating. Yes. You may grieve again. Because now they're going to middle school. What does that change look like for them? Because what we know to be true with children of autism, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, most of them like schedules. Yes. Normalcy. (laughs) Yes, routine. Routine. Mm. So you have really have really got them in a place of routine. You are really good. And now here comes middle school. Here's that conflicting feeling. They made it. Mm -hmm. You're excited. And then you often feel overwhelmed, fearful, because now it's starting a new routine again. Mm -hmm. What is this change going to do to my baby? Yes, yes. You have to be okay with the flare-ups. And when the flare-ups happen, because you've done the work of getting to restoration with that, that pain, that heartache, you can now identify it. Mm. And once you identify it, then you can say, I know what to do with it. Yes. I, I think that, you know, that is a, a good point because oftentimes we don't understand that there will be flare ups. Mm-hmm. You know, we're like, oh my gosh, what what is going on? You know, am I, and they see it as, a, you know, a setback, not understanding that this is a process. It is a process. It's an ever-changing process. And you have to give yourself permission to grieve. Yes. It is okay not to be okay mm. and not have all the answers. Yes, especially that last piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and like you were saying, um, anchoring down in the truth. I think that is such a a difficult thing as parents because, you know, we don't want to be judged. We don't want to be shamed. And then also facing the truth for ourselves is difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hard. And oftentimes... What's scary for me is I see a lot of people masking it. Mm, Yes. And because they're not dealing with it, 
they begin to pacify the hurt. And when you pacify the hurt and it surface up, you may turn to alcohol, you may turn to, to, to drugs, you may, beginning, you may begin spending more time at work so you don't have to deal with the reality at home. Those are some hard truths. But you need a safe place to talk about those hard truths so you can begin to process those feelings. You need it. Yes. Mm, I, I cannot, you know, thank you enough for telling us about your five anchors for normalizing grief for us. Cause I think a lot of times that doesn't happen. We're not used to grieving. We're not used to the emotions. So thank you you know, for all of that information on how to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any resources, tips, or advice for parents as we begin to wrap up? I think one of the best tips and resources that I can provide is if you go to herdeenmercier.com forward slash resources, you can join the Grief Crusaders Facebook group community. Mm -hmm. where we'll welcome you, we'll see you, and we'll validate you. And there will never be any judgment. Mm. And that's the Grief Crusaders community. Another resource when you go to that website is a book. It's an ebook that you can get that really breaks down grief for you. And it's the Grief Recovery Method Guide for Loss because you're an experience a loss of normalcy. And it's 61 tips on how to experience, how the experience of grief, how to experience grief and really process it. And then another great resource is my podcast where I am highlighting grief and making you look at heartbreak totally different. That you'll see it shows up in relationships, it shows up at the job, it shows up in your home, it shows up literally everywhere that you, where there's a heartbeat, a heartbeat, grief shows up everywhere where there is a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we cannot avoid, we cannot avoid any heartbreak. Yes. And because grief is a normal reaction to any, 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 I hope I make that clear, any loss, that cannot be policed by others. Your grief journey cannot be policed by others. How you feel cannot be minimized by others. And I am on a campaign through all those platforms to educating people as a grief advocator that grieving is normal mm -hmm. and natural and the sooner you do something about your grief journey, the sooner you will feel a sense of relief and get to a place of grief to purpose. I love that. And we will have all of those links in our, our show notes as well. Mm -hmm. So where can the audience reach you, especially if they're wanting to, you know, deal with their grief and, and, you know, uh, have more intimate work with the five anchors. Definitely visit my website under contact and schedule a free consultation. It's a 30 minute consultation. Well, you'll be have the opportunity for us to discuss and just make sure I'm a fit. We're a fit. And just looking at your, your maybe grief experience and talking about it and seeing if we can move forward. Because the truth of the matter is, you have to be really ready. And you won't know if you're ready until you do a discovery call. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for all of these such helpful information that you just shared with every one of us. You know, I've learned so much personally about my own grief process. So thank you so much. You are so welcome. And a lot more of this are on literally on all my social media platforms, even LinkedIn, as well as YouTube channel, Herdeen Mercier, Herdeen Mercier on all social media platforms. I am on a campaign and 
This is my life calling. Mm -hmm. I am determined to help people live out their life purpose by actually anchoring down in their truth about their heartache. Yeah, so make sure to go follow her. Make sure to go check out her resources on her website because I'm telling you, you will not, 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 not regret it. (laughs) So please check her out. Thank you so much for being on the podcast and thank you all for listening to this episode and we will see you on the next episode. If you haven't done so, make sure to subscribe to our podcast so you can always be notified when a new episode drops. To get the resources shared on today's podcast and the show notes, make sure to go to autismandblack.org slash podcast. And be sure to share your takeaways from the show on IG stories and Twitter using our official hashtag AIBpod so that we can find them and share them. And if you want to continue the conversation from today's episode, make sure to join our Autism in Black podcast Facebook community. And please make sure to answer the questions to gain entry. Thank you for listening and joining me this week. Have a good one.